everybody. Welcome back to another episode of the Futurum Tech Webcast. I'm your host, Daniel Newman, Principal Analyst, Founding Partner, Futurum Research. Very excited about this interview series, which I will be doing today with Contentful CEO, Steve Sloan. We're going to be talking a little bit about what's going on in digital. We're going to talk about some of the macro, uh, you know, of course, because tech has been in the news a lot coming here into the beginning parts of 2022. Uh, then we're going to dive a little bit more and learn about Contentful. This is an exciting company with a lot of growth, a later stage VC-backed company, but some that you're going to hear about quite a bit in the months and years to come, company I've been following very closely over the last couple of years. Um, and so as always, I hope you're strapped in and ready for a great show. So without further ado, Steve, welcome to the Future of Tech webcast. Super happy to have you here today. Daniel, thanks for having us. It's great to be here. Well, I've been waiting to have this uh, conversation, Steve. You could ask your team, I think, for about 12 months. I'm like, hey, when's Steve going to come on the pod? I got to <laughs> talk to him. Um, but like everything, it's been super busy. And while time has flown, you guys have been doing a lot of good things. I've seen uh, another round. I've been hearing so much about uh, you know, the, the rapid proliferation of uh, CX and, and content and how it's changing the world. Of course, the pandemic sped that along. but uh, Quick background, just say hello to everybody, uh, introduce yourself. I know you're the CEO, but just talk a little bit about Contemple and your time there. How long have you, you been there? When did you start it or found it or when were you brought in? Um, you know, give a little bit of the history and, and then we'll, we'll talk about some macro before getting back into Contemple. All right. Thanks so much, Danielle. So uh, Contemple was born in Berlin. Uh, so I'm not one of the founders. I joined in 2019, but our two founders, Sasha and Paolo, uh, when they started the company, it was really born of necessity. They had, uh, at the time, they were building mobile applications, mostly for big companies. And the insight that they had was that every time you build a mobile app, you have to build the back end of it, the place where you store all of that important information that a customer will ultimately see. But the interesting thing about mobile apps is you have to build one for iOS and one for Android. And so as any great developer knows, when you find yourself building the same thing over and over and over again, you build a tool or a platform or a product that actually does that once so you can then replicate it. And when they built that for themselves, they then realized, well, wait a second, a bunch of our other developer friends are probably going to need that, this. And so that was really the genesis of the company is figuring out a way to make the content that is going to be on any device in the world uh, accessible to developers very easily um, on any, again, on any device so you can deliver it at any time. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, the history is, uh, you know, these things always take a little bit longer. You start to hear about a name. And by the time you're hearing about the name of the company, most people don't realize it's like, yeah, it's a startup, but it's not, you know, they've been doing it a while. It's very, very rare that the company kind of comes out of nothing. And then like in two years gets to where you're at. It's usually there's been five, six, seven years in the background, hard work, ton of tough years and meager years. And anyone that's been part of a startup knows that that end product, that's what they love to talk about on TV. And, and you know, that's what the the uh, Fortune and Forbes love to write about, but that that back end story. So you've come in to, to really lead something that had a lot of foundation, it's been built, and now it's sort of ready to explode. And, and you seem to be in a really good position to do that. And I want to come back to that in a few minutes. But every time I have the chance to, to speak to a CEO right now, you know, given that we're in January 2022, and I always say that because as much as I like to assume everybody listens to every show right when it comes out, these shows actually have a pretty long tail. So people will be listening to this in six months or a year, but this is January 2022. And it's pretty hard right now not to turn on the news and see headlines about the tech rack. Uh, you know, the last three months, really, tech has been pretty deflationary. Values have been compressing growth, especially startup companies, maybe some that went public, SPACs have all been really hammered. And we've even seen some of the bigger tech companies start to compress a little bit. And there's a lot of various macroeconomic factors, Steve. There's there's inflation, there's potential interest rates. We now have possible war. We have an election this year. We have so much going on. So I always love to chat to you know CEOs because, of course, you're looking at this, whether it's to raise your next round, whether it be maybe looking at IPOs, or whether it's just making sure you're properly set up to survive any sort of big pivot after a couple very positive years, despite, I don't know, a massive pandemic. So what are you kind of thinking about? What's the macro environment got you thinking about these days, Steve? You know, like you said, there's so many external factors moving all over the place, interest rates, uh, 
how people feel, you know, there's sentiment plays in all of this in such a big way. Valuation multiples, they go up, they go down. And we really try and ask ourselves, like, what are the fundamentals? When we look at customers, you know, we have four core values, one of which is start with a customer and work backwards. So when we spend time with those customers, what are the durable trends that are affecting them? What are they trying to accomplish? And let's stay laser focused on those elements because all of those external factors are going to move around. You know, one of the interesting things is that in spite of lots of movement in the public markets with respect to valuations, they're an incredible, we're, we have this incredible generation of companies, tech companies that have been born that are transforming all sorts of industries. And whether valuations go up or go down, that's not going to change. And so the same thing is true in, in our world, our sort of corner of the tech world. And a big part of that is, you know, these devices, these mobile devices, these have become the front door to every business on the planet. And COVID brought that into clarity for all kinds of businesses, B2C and B2B both. And in many cases, it really was sort of the crossing of the Rubicon. You know, the, the companies who really were clinging to uh, their sort of traditional way of doing business realized they had to change. They had to change now, or they had to accelerate the pace of change to catch up with consumer demands and consumer preferences. And so our view is that if we can stay really focused on the durable trends, and as much as we can, ignore the noise of the ups and the downs, we can create value for our customers and continue to build a long-term, stable, durable software franchise, which is what we hope to do. Yeah, I love that you said that. That's one of those things that I think just digital experiences, technology, apps has given us so much exposure to information. You know, when you were, you know, 40, 50 years ago, our parents and our grandparents, they wanted to know how their 401k or IRA or whatever investment vehicles they had. You had to actually buy a newspaper, open it up, have a look at it. You, did, you had to call your, your, your stockbroker, whatever it was. And these are assuming you were participating. And of course, now with all this technology with Robin Hoods and SoFi's, the participation in the market is exponential, uh, both public and private. You got things like our crowd now where you can get involved in startups um, you know, at a rate that you never could. And, and I love what you said, though, is, you know, like with real estate, your house values go up and they go down. And most people, unless you're in the market to sell, you don't think about it. You're like, oh, you know, you're like, my house is up. My house. Unless you need to sell it or you need equity out of it, you don't really care what it's worth because you're like, I live where I want to live. It's a good house. Private companies, very much the same. Your business value goes up, it goes down. Some years you had bigger revenue, you had greater margins, you won some great customers, business value went up. But unless you're looking to sell it, you're not thinking about it. But something about the public market and crypto and all of this fast money has created such a short horizon in people's mind that they're not looking at fundamentals anymore. They're not looking at, hey, am I building the right products? And if I do that, so I always think about folks like yourself in these roles and sometimes in these public companies that have just been, you know, you saw, I think they said 40% of the NASDAQ dropped 50% or more over the last three months. And you think about these, these CEOs and it's like, you know, have they lost confidence? Has anything changed in their business? Are they going to do anything different, Steve? And I think in the end, most of them are like, they're thinking exactly like you, building building robust technologies, tools, durable uh, solutions, winning customers. And, and they figure if I do all that right, in the long run, this will all work out. So I think that's a great kind of approach that you're taking is keep doing things right and the value will come. You know, of course, you'll have to deal with those ups and downs related to uh, the private public kind of the 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 uh, you know gap that might exist between valuations and when you decide to raise, but those are decisions that people in your role do make. Um, but I love that you gave kind of that broad macro perspective. I think in the long run, great companies building amazing products, serving their customers, and taking care of their employees do always. And I can feel I feel confident saying this: always win out. So let's turn a little bit to digital now, because this is kind of you guys were born to to really shape this conversation, right? So much talk about digital transformation. This isn't new. It's been going on for, I don't know, two or three decades, really. But over the last decade, digital transformation became a word. I wrote a couple of books about it. I'm still yeah. very angry that I use the term because <laughs> everybody uses the term now. But as you, you guys really were built to help companies transform, talk a little bit about what you're seeing in that journey. Where are companies at? Um, you know, how is that sort of shaping your decision making in the, in the development of your products? 
You know, well, I actually think it's great that you use that term early on. I mean, you have you have insightful writers like yourself who who queue up these ideas, and you know, it takes a long time for these ideas to disseminate a, and then for the for them to come true because there's so much hard work in these transformations. They happen over decades. You know, if we if we wind back two decades, you know, one of the things about the early web is you had companies like eBay or or uh, or Amazon who were born digitally. And so clearly for them, there was no transformation. That's where they were born. But for many, many other companies, you know, the initial digital transformation wasn't much of a transformation. They popped up a website and it was a digital brochure. It was this, it was this thing that was really separate from their business. Like even five, eight years ago, if you looked on a lot of websites of B2B and B2C companies, they would give you a phone number or an email to reach out to. So it's sort of this on-ramp into their traditional way of doing business. And what we've seen more recently in this digital transformation, again, we call it the digital first era, is that companies have gotten very clear that the way in which their customers want to be engaged with is digital first. That might be your bank. That might be you know the, the clothing companies that you favor. It could be, you know, car companies. We we service a number of the the premier brands of, of automobile companies around the world, and that's been one of the things that's been so fascinating for me to watch. Which is, you know, five eight years ago they had a digital brochure. Today, you know, if your customers want to do all of their discovery and evaluation of a new vehicle digitally, how do you create the best elements of that showroom experience? to work on a mobile device first and on the web second, you know, that's a trans that is a transformation of the business and it requires you to entirely rethink how to do business. Tesla has clearly done this the best where you can do everything right from your phone. In fact, our CFO recently bought a Tesla from her <laughs> phone, which is pretty amazing. But we see many other businesses going through that transformation. And so the question within all of that then is, what are the key elements to being successful in these transformations? Because the ultimate truth lives in consumer preference. What is it that our customers demand from us? And what signals are they giving us about how they want to be served? That is where the world will go. And those of us who don't listen, you know, do that at our own peril. And you know, we've definitely seen venerable brands disappear over the past year. Um, or year or two, like the largest um, uh, travel agency in Europe went bankrupt. One of the, you know, some, several actually of the most uh, longstanding premier retail clothing brands in the United States went into bankruptcy and some went away. And so the, the companies who aren't able to make this transformation will go away. And the fact that it's an existential risk, not just in a binary way, but also in terms of how you compete within that group of companies who have come to this realization and made these changes is going to be a real difference maker for those who succeed and those who become sort of middling companies. Yeah, I love that you you sort of put all that together. I'm, I'm thinking back, even my second book was called The New Rules of Customer Engagement. I actually started out with a, with a metaphor about cars. Uh, and the fact that you pointed that out, I mean, seven or eight years ago, I was thinking about information parity. You know, just the fact that the car buying experience because of digital online data accessibility, the, the shopping experience had gone in many ways from uh, the seller having all the advantages to the buyer having many of the advantages. And then what we've seen over the last few years that you mentioned is the advent of customer experience being almost entirely digital, meaning everything from designing the vehicle, being able to see what it's going to look like, being able to move the paint colors, change the wheels and the tires being able to get pricing data from you know various zip codes around the, the country in real time, having all your financing set up in, in perfect harmony where you're literally walking in, there's no sale anymore. You're already a buyer. Yes. And the entire th thing then comes down to how seamless do you make the experience? You know, Do I have to even go into a showroom? Can I just go into an experience center like you mentioned with Tesla and literally just walk in, they kind of hand you the key, they teach you how to use it um, if you want, or they say, there's another way to learn, you can do it online. You know. And off you go, and they've completely um, eliminated all the friction in the experience, which you know kind of makes uh, me want to. I wish we had more time because I love this digital to CX thing. But really, what you're saying is that 
the digital transformation has really all become about being able to create that perfect customer experience, physical, digital, omni, blended. Of course, we're hearing metaverse, but that's a little more of a buzzword, but it will be a thing at some point. But let's pivot here because I, I could spend a lot of time with this uh, uh, with you on this, Steve, but I want to talk about Contempo a little bit here. So talk to me a little bit about kind of how you guys are approaching solving this because there are, are many companies, right? There's big companies, there's startup companies. You guys are rapidly growing in this space, trying to solve this exact problem for some really important companies all over the world. Yeah. So one of the most important things that's really changed is you know, it used to be that companies had a website, a single property where you could go and see uh, see the set of products, learn. But this set of digital experiences means that there are many, many, many digital properties. You know, even our we serve about a third of the Fortune 500, and so in these large companies you can have thousands of digital properties and digital experiences. That could be a help center, that could be sort of the blog or the place where you have community engagement, that could be the, the marquee site, but it also could be sites for um, campaigns. And then you have things like, uh, my son and I are about to go skiing and the place we're going, you know, they have a, an app that's all about your experience when you're actually on the mountain. So all of those different experiences um, are wonderful and engaging. The challenge that so many companies face is twofold. First, you want them to be, be compelling. And so you really need builders. That is people at your company, or you might have a close partner, you know, some of the, the big digital agencies who you work with in order to envision how those could work for your customers, but then to bring them to life, to actually write the code. And so there's, there's all of that building that goes on. There's a second component, though, which is you want to make sure those experiences are consistent. And the companies in, in sort of the half generation ago that really discovered at the, at the early stages, all of this expansion and really explosion of digital properties was wonderful and differentiating on one hand, but it was very, very hard to ensure a consistent experience across those. And so Contentful is a content platform. A, pl a place where all of that information, it could, be, it could be images, it could be video, it could be audio, it could be the descriptions of your products, but it also could be um, information about a, what something about uh, a what a customer's ordered. All of that can live in a single platform. And then it will be consistent regardless of the specific app or website that it's served up into. And importantly, it needs to be delivered in basically real time every time. And you know, one of the things we know is that customers are, are wonderfully impatient about their experiences. If it's not delivered immediately to their device, wherever they are in the world, they will frequently skip ahead to something else. And so we help people store, manage, and deliver content on any device anywhere in the world in real time. Which again, Steve, is sort of the foundation of what the market is, the leaders in your space are doing, and that's what you're doing. So this is the moment where I'm going to ask you to talk a little bit about how you differentiate, because, you know, I can think of some of the smaller players, I can think of some of the bigger players. Um, you guys have, you've jettisoned into the, the market's eyes. I'm, I'm watching, you know, I'm hearing about your deals. I'm, I'm reading about companies that are using. The success has been bountiful. Um, if I may say, and I guess as an analyst, that's probably something you'd like, like hearing, but that's what my assessment has been. Um, but why? I guess that's kind of like where, okay, I hear what you're saying. You're doing the right things. That's what customers want. But why Contentful and, and not some of these other big name companies that are trying to do the same thing? Yeah. One of the secrets for us is, you know, we were, um, we have two developer founders, so builder founders. So we really think of ourselves as by builders and for builders. And that's really been the change that, you know, the, the generation of products that came before were all about making it very easy to, and, and it was, by the way, this was the right decision back then in a different set of conditions. But today, um, you have to serve the builders who are creating these compelling and differentiated experiences. They want the tools to do exactly what they want to do. And so we have a, a set of APIs and there are a set of you know, other tools that wrap around that that make it very easy for both builders and then secondarily for their builder teammates 
who are wrapped around the creation and evolution of these experiences who we serve most directly. And so we started out as four APIs directly for those uh, developers. And in the last two years, we've expanded the platform. And then uh, last year, we released our first two apps that sit on top of that platform. And what that helps us do is start with the developers, the builders who are going to create the foundation. But then you have lots of people wrapped around the evolution of those experiences over time. So as an example, one of the challenges people have is sometimes you have to go in and, and make a really quick, relatively cosmetic change to an app or website. It might be a change of like a disclaimer. It might be that you want to change out an image because the season has changed. And so we've created a new app that sits on top of our platform that we call Compose that allows someone who's not as technical to go in and make those quick changes. One of the other things we have seen is that because people have thousands of these digital properties, you really need almost like an air traffic control system to determine you know, when these different, whether it's campaigns or sites are going live, are they approved, what phase are they in? Um, and we've seen companies embrace that set of tools to make it really easy to ensure the right thing goes live for their customer at the right time. And so for us, you know, we are going to continue to build out that set of the expansion of the platform, but also the apps that sit on top of us in order to ensure that our customers have a great experience for all of the people inside of the company. There's a third important element, and this really relates to the fact that Again, we, we started from the developer focus. We've built an ecosystem of hundreds of other companies who have built directly onto our platform to create things like headless commerce experiences, to enable things like translation services directly onto the platform. And so we are building out that ecosystem of other partners so that together with our partners, Whenever a customer has a problem and they come to us and say, hey, Contentful Team, can you help us with fill in the blank? Our answer can be yes. Either we'll help you or one of our partners will help you go from where you are today to where you envision you might want to be in the future. Yeah, there's so many really compelling cases too, Steve. You know, I was kind of just looking through about your publicly referenceable customers. You've got you know, legacy uh, retailers like Staples that you guys are helping to transform, which are companies that are going to be exactly in the center of that looked at as, oh, will they survive? Because they are really kind of were a long big box. And now you're helping build that kind of experience. And then you're working with luxury brands like Bang & Olufsen. Uh, you're working with recently acquired companies uh, like Costa Coffee, uh, which is now part of, uh, I think, Coca-Cola is, is, is where that fits in now. So you're winning these big customers. You're helping them transform. You're, you're, you're accelerating their pace. I only have a couple minutes here left with you. Um, I want to. I did want to say one of the things I've said. And I want. I've used this analogy. Is I feel like the way you've treated your developer community mirrors very closely to Twilio, which I've admired a lot. By the way, in terms of how successful they've been able to do, they're still trying to create things that accelerate and speed development. But they've also really stuck by the fact that what a developer can add to their experience. And you guys are kind of doing the same thing when it comes to really building the best uh, online, digital, mobile experiences. I love asking folks like yourself when you join the show, though, just kind of about what you see ahead. So let's talk, let's just end kind of on that, uh, Steve. What do you see for digital transformation, experience, uh, design? What's the next year, uh, you know, what's it got in store? What are you sort of looking at? I really think we are just at the beginning of this transformation where you know, builders are defining the, the, the set of experiences and really the, and really helping us bring to life the experiences that our customers demand. I really do think that this digital first era will continue to move forward, but more and more companies we're seeing have come to the realization that they need builders directly in their company. What, again, whether it's they're, they're hired and they're full-time employees, or they have these very close partnership relationships with, with agencies where they're sort of virtual team members. I think that is going to be one of the things that is going to continue to, to change companies from the inside out. Because in so many cases, when you, know, when you don't have builders inside of your company, you don't even realize what's possible. One of the things I love about serving developers is every day 
they show us a new thing that's possible with the platform because they have a brilliant idea about how to, how to use it in, in a new and, and different way. And so in many ways, we sort of follow our, our developer customers and they shine a light on what is possible and what can be built. And I think more and more, in particular, more and more traditional companies are sort of waking up to that reality and inviting more of those developers and those builders into their companies in order to create compelling experiences for the customers they serve and those they hope to serve. Yeah, I love that you pointed out just how important developers are. Pretty much every platform or application that all of us use every single day that we love, that has changed our lives, has been fundamentally built because of what developers are capable of. Of course, there's always the ideas, there's always the jobs and the was, but you know, without developers, the, the visions of the jobs never come to life. So Steve, thank you so much for taking the time to join me here on the Future in Tech webcast. Love having these conversations. You have really great insights into you know, what's going on right now. Of course, Rootin' for Contentful, very interesting company in an important space. I look forward to kind of hearing what's next whether that's uh, you know your next round, an IPO, or just another great year. Um, always excited to watch what's going on in the private markets. Um, we'll have to have you back soon. You in? Absolutely. Dana, thanks for, your, for your, all the insights you've offered us over the years, and thanks for having us on today. Yeah, more to come, I promise you, Steve. So, hey, everybody, uh, hit that subscribe button and check out the show notes. Uh, we'll put some links in there to some of the things that Steve talked about and some of the information that I talked about because – Love for you to take the time to click and learn a little bit more. Uh, definitely love to have you subscribe to the show uh, if you haven't already. Uh, there's so many great interviews here with great CEOs just like Steve Sloan here from Contentful. Um, and otherwise, it's time to say goodbye. So thanks for tuning in, and we will see you next time. Bye-bye now.